Hi everyone, welcome to Kembali 2020, a Rebuild Bali Festival, a digital program designed to inspire, excite, reconnect, and revitalize the Balinese and Indonesian community from October 29 to November 8, 2020. Kembali, the Indonesian word for return or comeback, represent revitalization in the face of global challenges. The festival will unite people in Bali and Indonesia together with an international audience at a time when travel is largely impossible and creating connection is more important than ever before. My name is Iwayan Juniata. I will be the moderators and our speakers for the sessions is the charming award-winning Australian uh, writers, uh, Kate Forsyth. Hi, Kate. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, well, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you for, for sending this gorgeous book. I enjoyed it immensely. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Thank you. Now I'm looking forward for a free copy of your new book. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that, 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 that you have a new book uh, out this week. I do. Can you show us? Yes, uh, isn't it pretty? Yeah, so, yeah, the cover is gorgeous. It's called Searching for Charlotte, the fascinating story of Australia's first children's author. Um, her mm -hmm. name is Charlotte Waring Atkinson, and she's my great, 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 great grandmother. So mm. I come from a long line of writers and poets, and Charlotte Waring Atkinson was probably the most important of them. The cover features her art. She was um, an artist as well as an author. But that's that's her drawing. Yeah, and see, look, if you look inside, uh -huh. you see the beautiful artwork in there. So um, I've been very busy out and about um, talking about my great, 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 great grandmother. Mm. Um, I wrote the book with my sister. So it's been a really mm. wonderful experience for us. Um, And people just find it fascinating that there are so many writers in our family where, you know, there's just generations of us. But could you give us a brief sneak peek of, of, of the, the, the books? Absolutely. So um, Searching for Charlotte um, is um, a combined memoir written mm. by my sister and I about what it was like to grow up in such a literary family. And that is interwoven with um, an intimate biography of our great, 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 great grandmother. Um, she was English born. Um, she came out to Australia in 1826 to be um, a governess for the MacArthur family, which was a, a very important kind of colonial family. <laughs> and um, on board the ship, she met the, the love of her life. It was love mm. at first sight and they were engaged within three weeks and they were married when she was in Sydney um, and they settled in the Southern Highlands of New South Wales. But when um, her youngest child, she had four children, when her youngest daughter was only a newborn, her husband died uh, tragically of mm. typhoid and she was left a, um, a widow Um, and she suffered all sorts of travails and struggles, you know, mm. um, violence, uh, prejudice, poverty, um, grief. And she struggled through these overwhelming odds to write the first published children's book in Australia. And that was published in 1841. So next year is the 180th anniversary. The centennial, yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's so it's, um, you know, we grew up on the stories of her and we were always fascinated by her life and she's unjustly forgotten. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so my sister and I have worked together for the last three years to, to discover her story and to uh, you know, rescue her from oblivion. Well, was there any picture of her, Kate? Yes. So if um, what, one of the things that we found when we were researching this book is this beautiful self-portrait of her as a young woman. Do you think she looks as, like me? As, yeah, no, <laughs> as a Greek goddess, you know. <laughs> yeah, she was beautiful. So she was known for her dark curly hair 
and mm. and black eyes, just like mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but my question is, uh, uh, did the fact that you have a great 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 grandmothers who was uh, very uh, accomplished writers, did that fact influence somehow your decision to be an author? So, it's hard to know. I think I think it, it must have. Um, I always knew I wanted to be a writer. I was mm-hmm. writing stories and poems from the time I was a very young child. Mm-hmm. You know, I wrote my first novel when I was only seven years old, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I was always um, writing poetry and stories. And my sister and I, when we weren't writing or reading, we were playing imaginative mm-hmm. games um, mm-hmm. that were like stories, acting out stories. Um, I don't know if it was, if I, I felt so strongly about being a writer because I, I knew that there were writers in my family. It just seemed very mm-hmm. natural to me and I can't imagine doing anything else. else but people... Know. Yeah, people have said to me, the thing is, though, is that you grew up knowing that it was possible to be a writer. Well, mm-hmm. for many people, th- th- uh, you know, writers always seem to be either dead or live a long time ago, <laughs> or live a long, a long distance away. Well, I, I mean, I knew, um, I knew that there were writers in my family. And so perhaps it gave me permission to dream about mm. being a writer. Oh, that, that's that's a very gorgeous expression. A permission to dream, but but uh, uh, how did you decide then on on historical fiction, on fairy tales? I mean, there's yeah. there's a, a lot many genre that you could decide, and you are a former journalist. I am. So um, I worked as a journalist after I finished my first degree, um, but I always knew I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to write poetry and novels. They were my mm. But that was my dream. Um, ever since I was a very, very small child, I have mm-hmm. always loved to read books that are set long, long ago and far, far away. Mm. That's always what I've loved to read. Um, because I had a childhood accident when I was um, very young, I spent a lot of my early childhood in and out of hospital. And even mm. when I wasn't in hospital, um, I was often sick. And so my physical life was quite uh, limited, you know, by illness. Mm. And so it, my, my, the life of the imagination was enormously important to me. I mm. could be anything. I could, you know, gallop on white hulk horses through dark forests. I could, you know, be a pirate on and sail the seven seas. I could mm. be some kind of hero. And so a lot of my time was spent in bed being sick, <laughs> but escaping through the pages of a book. And so I was always drawn to write the type of stories that I love to read, which mm. a book set long, long ago and far, far away. Mm-hmm. As I grew older and I studied literature um, and mm. had, uh, I realised that there were two types of books. Um, some books are a mirror and, the, and when the reader experiences that book, they're holding up a mirror to their to themselves and to their own lives. And they're seeing their experiences reflected back at them. And other Mm. books are windows. Mm. And the reader looks through that window and discovers things that they have never known before. And they can travel places they've never been. And so my books are windows. And I, I offer my readers the chance to go back in time or to go to places they've only ever dreamed of going, or even going to imaginary worlds, ones that I created out of my own mm-hmm. imagination. And um, it just feels um, very natural to me. I'm, I feel like I'm being true to myself when I write that type of book. But, but, but Kate, your book is not only a window. I mean, I read the, the, the Blue Rose, it's also mirrors. I mean, uh, you you detail the reign of terrors, and and if if we replace the name, if we replace the years, we are basically in the contemporary world right now, where people believe that by beheading people, by killing people, you can either impose your idea upon other people or you destroy the idea of those people you are behaving. So it is 
absolutely true. Um, and that, I mean, so my novel, The Blue Rose, is set during the French Revolution, mm -hmm. during the terror of the French Revolution, when um, there was a great deal of, you know, uh, violence and injustice and cruelty um, and, you know, a, a dictatorship that, um, you know, decided who could live and who could die. Um, and to me, it was really, really important to write The Blue Rose at a time when our own world was engulfed in so much darkness and such mm. a sense of, of despair and fear for the future. And I, I wanted to write about the French Revolution because there are so many eerie parallels between mm. France then and our world now. And I wanted to show people that um, you can live through times of great danger and times of great cruelty, but the human spirit is astonishingly resilient and you can find um, joy and love and purpose and uh, meaning even at the darkest of times in human history. Oh, well, was that the reason why you chose to close the Blue Rose uh, with, with the happy ending? Yes, it was, um, it was a very conscious decision. I felt that the world needed stories of... Um, uh, that celebrated human happiness, mm -hmm. that celebrated the fact that you can fight against injustice and tyranny, you can change the world. Before the French Revolution, uh, France was, its culture, its society, its politics was rusted shut in this kind of feudal mm -hmm. society where you had the king and the queen and you had the mm -hmm. church and the aristocracy and they had uh, unlimited freedom and power and wealth. And then you had this, um, you know, the peasants and the poor people who were uh, condemned to a life of um, poverty and hardship. And they, they couldn't change their world. Mm. Their world was locked into place. Mm. And yet they rose up, they, uh, they rebelled, they dreamt of a world in which um, all humans had the same rights and the same liberties, regardless of race or religion or colour or gender or any other uh, factor that tends to define us and sometimes confine us. They started this great revolution and that the world was changed forever. But in the wake of that revolution, came more injustice, more wrongness, more violence. Mm -hmm. And the French Revolution ran out of control. And the people who had begun it were horrified by, by the monster they had unleashed on the world. But they were able to, to regain control. They were able to bring back peace and uh, mm -hmm. And, the, and they created a new world out of the ashes of the old. And to me, I think it's really important to, to remember that. We have had cataclysmic upheavals in history in the past where there have been great pain and sorrow, but the human spirit finds the strength somehow to go on. So, so is that the message of hope? of yes. the ability of our human soul to overcome terrible tragedy is one of the main purpose uh, served by fairy tale and historical fiction in this contemporary world. Yes, I, I really do think so. I think that, um, you know, fairy tales are, are very old. Fairy mm. tales have been with us since the beginning of human history. Mm. Um, human language was invented. Well, we, we know it's at least 200,000 years old and it's probably as old as 5 million years. Yes. So we know that humans can communicate quite well just with grunt and gesture because mm. whenever we travel overseas, we can, we can ask for a bill we can express rage, we can express laughter with our, our 
our bodies and our sounds. But if we want to express deeper, more complex, more subtle emotions, if we want to tell our stories, we needed human mm. language. And so mm. from the very beginning, humans invented language to tell stories. And those mm. stories were um, lessons for the young. Mm. They were mm. a way of understanding this mysterious universe that we live in. Mm. They were a way of expressing and communicating with other humans. And so fairy tales, because they have existed for hundreds and thousands of years, mm. they're like a, a pure distillation of the human psyche. They mm. filled with darkness and brightness. Mm. They're filled with sorrow and joy, struggle and triumph. It's the, it's the story of the journey of the human soul into dark and hellish places and then back out into the brightness of a new world. And because they are stories of the triumph of the human spirit, because they offer hope to anyone who hears them or reads them, that you too can overcome injustice, you too can triumph in the end. It empowers the listener. It, and it, it, it gives them the chance to imagine a different world. So fairy tales offer us hope that we can change our mm. circumstances, our life. We can change the world. And I don't think there's any more important message. A truly poetic, kid. If, if, if we are not in a Zoom meeting, you know, in, 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 in a hall with, with audience, I will just clap. <laughs> it's truly no. but, but the pro But the problems, um, at least here in Indonesia, uh, we consider, a lot of people still consider fairy tale as the stuff for children. Mm. And history is the stuff for old people. So... What do you think? How, how we should approach it to make it more uh, interesting for, for the young audience? All right. So um, I'll address that first of all, because, of course, fairy tales were, were never meant for children. They were mm. meant for people of all mm. ages. Fairy tales were told, um, you know, right from the very beginning of human history when we used to crouch around mm. the fire and mm. um, we had storytellers that would tell stories to um, entertain us and to enchant us, but also to teach us and to warn us. Um, Philip Pullman, who's a British children's writer, he says, Thou shalt not is mm. soon forgotten, but once upon a time is always remembered. And so people who stand up on a pulpit and say, You shalt not do this. Well, the human spirit will always resist that. But yeah. if you come to them and you tell them this, you know, um, uh, magical, uh, enchanting, transformative story, what well, it pierces the heart. Mm -hmm. And that is what affects change. Being ordered to do something, very few people are going to want to obey. But being seduced to do something, that's how you change people's minds. That's a different story, heart. though. Exactly. And so that's what fairy tales do. And because uh, we are, you know, storytelling is encoded in our DNA. It's such a natural part of who we are as um, humans. Uh, humans have been called the storytelling animal. It's the one thing that distinguishes us from other living creatures. We long to tell our own stories and we long to connect to other humans by hearing their stories. It's the thing that creates understanding and empathy, regardless of geographical boundaries or, you know, generational boundaries. Um, storytelling transcends all boundaries. And so fairy tales were never meant for children. They were just meant for people regardless of your age. And to, to tell you the truth, for most people, people you know, when uh, an audience understands that I have a doctorate in fairy tales <laughs> and that I have studied fairy tales, people are very eager to share with me, oh, yes, I remember this story that I heard when I was a child and it spoke to me so powerfully and I, I have remembered it all of my life. And it has given me wisdom. I hear that 
again and again and again. So you're not alone in Indonesia thinking that fairy tales are pretty stories for very little children and have no other purpose. But I'm here to uh, enlighten you all to, <laughs> to the importance of fairy tales and also for their purpose now. They're not mm. old, not just old stories. They're still relevant today because fairy tales teach us how to live. And history? Well, I've always loved history. And I mm -hmm. agree. Um, I think that history is the same. Um, I think that it's dangerous to forget history. Mm -hmm. It's dangerous to forget what has been fought for in the past and to take mm -hmm. our freedoms and our rights and our liberties for granted. Mm -hmm. I think that um, by looking to the patterns of human behavior in the past, we can learn really important lessons and we can try not to keep repeating mm. the mistakes of the past. Now, a lot of people feel that the world has always been this way, but it hasn't. Mm. Um, for example, women's rights. The, yeah. French the French Revolution was one of the first time in human history that women joined together and marched and demanded rights for themselves. That was in 1789, and it took them 140 years after that to actually gain the basic right of being able to vote or the basic right mm. to, to education. But human history, you know, people think we've had these rights forever, and that's why it's so important that we keep teaching our young that they, that they have the power to make, to remake our world mm -hmm. and help us evolve to a better place. Great, Kate. Uh, which uh, bring us back to the blue rose. Yes. I mean, uh, I was so mesmerized by the way you develop and describe characters in, in, in the blue rose. Some of them are fictitious, fictitious and others are real life figures such as uh, Desmolins and Robespierre. You, you describe Robespierre as having a silky voice and fair complexions. Uh, what approach that you use in creating these truly believable characters? Oh, well, you know, thank you so much. And I'm so glad that you, know, that you felt as if there were real people on the page because that's always my aim. And um, <laughs> I work... In, in I, I read the chapter about the, those two doctors in, in, in the ship that traveled mm -hmm. to China. I know they are historical figures, but in, um, I searched for them. Uh, the, the, the information uh, didn't reveal anything about their uh, speech patterns or whether they are humorous or not. But reading it in, in, in the Blue Rose, they are two separate distinctive characters and very uh, believable. Oh, How thank you, you so then? much. Um, I, I think it's probably the greatest uh, challenge of being a creative writer mm -hmm. is how to bring people to life on the page. So for mm -hmm. me, um, it's a matter of, um, of coming to understand them myself, of mm -hmm. looking for anything um, that I can find about them or people like them in the historical mm -hmm. record. Um, I read a lot of primary, um, you know, primary sources Mm -hmm. um, and newspaper accounts, diaries and letters. The mm -hmm. French Revolution happened at a time when a great many people were literate. And so people were writing letters, for example, about Robespierre. Um, he was mm -hmm. described as having this um, silky, malevolent voice mm -hmm. and these strange green eyes that people mm -hmm. found quite um, hypnotic. Um, mm. he was, he was described as, um, as being so pale. It was as if the sun had never touched his skin. Yes. Um, so I, I drew on these accounts of, uh, people of the time who knew mm. him, who had seen him or heard him speak. And then I, I, I wove that into my creation of them. Um, you know, obviously Marie Antoinette and Louis the 16th. Uh, important characters in in the book and so I studied um I read everything I could find about them but the whole time I was thinking of them as being people 
Mm. What did they fear? What did they want? Mm. What misconceptions did they have about the world? How were they misunderstood? What mm. did they really love? Um, and that is how how you understand uh, a hum- uh, character. You make them human. Mm. And then you allow them to be human on the page. Mm. And, and what decision involved that you decide Luna will have three legs instead of four? Yeah, so you're talking about about Luna, who is the who is um, my heroine's name is Vivian, yeah. and she's, yeah, she's the daughter of a marquis, so she's a noblewoman. Um, it see, it was very important to me that Vivian um, was seen, um, you know, was able to show that she was uh, uh, a compassionate yeah. person, caring. <laughs> caring and that she um, feared that she detested cruelty and so um, I wanted her to be I mean when I was a little girl I was always rescuing her animals and bringing them home my father was a vet and Mm -hmm. so if I found a bird that had a broken wing I would wrap it up and I'd bring it home and then my dad would make it better and so I I gave that quality to Viviane um I imagined her um, loving um, this dog who had had a paw caught in a, a, a mole catcher's trap mm-hmm. and that um, other people thought that the dog should have been killed and she was mm-hmm. determined to save its life. That to me was a way of showing um, that she had a compassionate nature mm-hmm. and that was an important part of me building her character. So, um, and then of course, um, once I decided to have a three-legged dog, I kept seeing three-legged dogs everywhere that I went. <laughs> and so I'd be in the park and I'd be going, oh, it can run, it can run just as fast as any other dog. Yeah. Oh, and I would, I would actually film them or write descriptions of them so that I could bring Vivian's dog Luna to life as well. And it really caught my attention. I mean, <laughs> the three-legged dog. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah. uh, Kate, there, there are two scenes mm. in the book that, that moved me greatly. Uh, the, the first one is when the prisoners uh, who are waiting for their execution day, practicing their death in an effort to be able to meet their end as elegantly as possible. Mm. This is a very haunting but also familiar scene for me being a balinese uh, Mm -hmm. we are always being told that you have to prepare for your death but this this scene is so i mean breathtaking because uh, i know how they value their life how they want to to live they know their execution is calm but they don't they, they didn't know exactly at which day they will be executed and they practice their death how, yeah. did, how did you come to that? Well, this is historically accurate. This is what actually um, mm-hmm. happened in, in the prisons um, in Paris um, mm-hmm. at the time of the terror of the French Revolution. Um, mm-hmm. There are a number of first-hand accounts um, mm-hmm. and, there, and there were um, a number of people who survived the terror who were, mm-hmm. who were released from prison um, after Robespierre was assassinated mm-hmm. and, and they wrote about their experiences and they all talked about how when they were in the prison, um, every day they would act out. And so one person would, would pretend to be the executioner. One person would pretend to be or, you know, the guards. And then the person uh, who, who thought they were most likely to die next mm-hmm. would act out having to step up onto the scaffold, having to kneel and lay their head and wait for the guillotine to chop off their heads. And the hope was that by practicing their death, they would be able to conquer their fear and they would come to the moment of execution with dignity and with grace and mm. with, um, and hopefully arouse pity in the, in the mob. Um, and this really, really struck me when I read about this, I, I just imagined what it would be like Today after day after day, never knowing when it was your turn to be executed, 
seeing your friends and your family, your beloved, um, you know, your loved ones uh, being taken away and knowing that they were dying and this constant staring into the face of death, um, I, I, I knew that I had to bring it to life on the page, that this was a scene I, I had to describe. And it was, I felt it was an important one um, for Viviane to mm. enact this and then to decide that she was going to fight to live, mm. that she was going to somehow survive the terror. And, mm. um, you know, she chose life. And that was, mm. I think, um, a really important psychological turning point in the book mm. when she decided to stop, you know, um, stop being a victim and fight for her right to live. Mm-hmm. And, and and the second scene is when the two protagonists, Fifian and David, Fifian in Paris and, and David uh, was in, in China, share the same dreams where they kiss each other. I'm, I'm so glad that you love that scene um, because, again, it was one that I, I um, knew or I felt quite strongly I had to write. Um, so uh, The Blue Rose is a story of impossible love. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a story of the, of the love between the daughter of a French marquis and a Welsh gardener. And in the world in which they lived, they could never be together because they were separated by class and by religion. And yet they longed for each other. They were separated by cruel circumstance. And um, then the rest of the book, they're separate. They're even on different continents. Mm. I I needed to show that they were still, that their love was surviving the separation, that they still longed for each other. And I had to find a way to show that. And the other thing is, is that they both thought the other one was dead. Mm. Vivian thought that David had been um, uh, killed by her her father. And um, David thought that Vivian had chosen to marry someone else, but then feared that she had died in the French Revolution. In the Revolution, yeah. And so I needed to find a way to connect them across the distance, the Mm. emotional and geographical distance now dreams are very important to me i i dream um i have very vivid dreams um and i've always believed that a dream is a kind of a message from your subconscious Mm. and so i i remember my dreams i write them down and i try and listen to them Mm. nearly always they're telling me to um to be more gentle on myself that i'm doing too much that I've taken on too much, um, <laughs> you know, they're anxiety dreams. You know? um, but I, I share dreams with people I'm really close to. So sometimes my sister and I will mm-hmm. have dream, will have had the same dream on the same night. And that's so strange and eerie and beautiful. Mm-hmm. So I thought, well, what, what, perhaps Viviane and David could share a dream. And perhaps that dream... Uh, helps them realize that they are meant to be together and they begin to struggle to get back together Mm. again because they have to come together over vast distances. Mm. Um, And so how I was going to weave that dream into the book, it was one of my earliest ideas and um, I I wanted to do so in a very delicate and subtle way Mm. so that when it actually happened, my hope would be that you'd actually have a bit of a lump in your throat. It mm. would it, it would feel magical. Mm. Is what is what was my hope. And suddenly, um, I have had a lot of um, email and and messages from readers who say that's one of their favourite scenes in the yes. book. That it it, it it was incredibly moving. Mm. And that that was my hope. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it's 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 truly moving, and and it. It, it also served as the most important turning point in, in the books because it rekindles the hope in, 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 in David and, and, and it, it also convinced Fifian about, about his, uh, her true destiny. So uh, this wonderful book, the, the Blue Rose, 
definitely require an, an extensive research. I learned that you travel to France and you travel to China with, with your son. So uh, can you tell me the interesting thing that you found during the research and how those things influence or, or being integrated in, 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 into the final form of the, of the story? Absolutely. So um, I, it is very important for me as part of my creative practice to go to uh, uh, the places where I set my books. Um, you know, it's not just that I need to see it and smell it and hear it um, and imagine myself into the past. It's, it's got something to do with um, when I'm writing a book, it's as if I've slipped into the skin of my, mm. uh, of my major characters. I inhabit their bodies. Mm. And when I go to the place, I don't necessarily go as myself. I go as them. And I imagine mm. how, they, how it would make them feel. I'm kind of searching for the emotional resonance of a place mm. and what... Um, how my characters would have felt being there. So it's a really important part of my creative practice. And so um, I always make sure that I do it. Now I'd been to France quite a few times before, um, but you know, going and imagining myself, what it would be like to be a young woman growing up in this privileged, luxurious life mm. that was really a cage. You know, um, to me, Viviane was as much trapped by the ancient regime as anyone else was because her she had no control. She, she could not choose who she married. She could not choose where she lived. She could not choose what she wore. Everything mm -hmm. about her life was, um, was imposed upon her. Mm -hmm. And I imagined how stifling that would be, how you would chafe against it, how you would long for freedom, mm -hmm. but how that freedom would seem impossible because the world was locked into this rigid um, class system. Mm -hmm. And then I imagine what it would be like to have the first glimmerings of um, hope that the world was changing. And maybe, just maybe, you could have, you, you could live a self-determined life. But then the fear and the horror, the French, being there made Vivian come to life in my imagination. And that meant that I could write her um, her story much more um, authentically, I suppose. Um, the, the other thing about um, going to France is seeing the effects of the French Revolution on French society now. They mm. are very proud of their secular society. Yeah. They are very proud that they were the first uh, country in the world to write a, a constitution of, of human rights. Mm. They're very proud of the fact that they have this um, extraordinarily rich, long history of struggle and triumph. And that um, was illuminating for me as well. So um, China, however, I had never been to China before. Mm. And I'd, I'd long been fascinated by uh, Chinese history and culture, but um, I felt that it was a secret to me. I I knew so little about it. I'd never been there, let alone lived there. And this was actually exactly the same as David, um, my hero. Mm -hmm. He was um, a part of the first British embassy to China mm -hmm. in in the seventeen nineties, and so not only were they seeing China for the first time, because of course China had been a closed society mm. for centuries. So they were the, among the first Britishers to go to China. China. And, they, and, and so there was a great culture clash between both of the cultures. Now I went to China with my son who was then 20. And my son, Ben is, um, is very tall. He's about six foot three. <laughs> He's very pale, mm. like me, and he's got um, very pale blue eyes, almost mm. like a grey blue coloured eyes. And, and, and David also has blue eyes and very I tall. Gave, uh, yeah. I gave David the look of my son. Ah, okay. Because when I was there in China with, with Ben, 
he, everywhere he went, he caused a sensation. He was so tall and so pale and his eyes are such an unearthly color blue. He's um, everywhere we went, people would p turn, point, stare at him. And lots, um, particularly when we went up into what was once in a Mongolia, um, mm. you know, uh, Beijing is an extremely cultured, sophisticated international city. And so having Westerners there was not such a surprise. But when we went up to Chengde, which is where mm. the Imperial Summer Palace was, okay. well, we saw no other Westerners. Mm. No one spoke English. None of the, you know, there was no, um, uh, all the shops were only in Chinese. And everywhere we went, Ben in particular, both of us were a cause of sensation. And everyone want, wanted to have photographs with Ben. And he's so tall and they were so small that he was having to bend down to, you know, get into the photograph. Anyway, it was extremely, um, it really showed me what the culture clash must have been like when these Britishers, um, you've got to imagine that there was, it, it was the 17th century. So they all mm. wore wigs, powdered wigs. Wig, and yeah. they painted their faces mm. and they had, um, you know, you know, the men wore high heels and they were wearing, mm. you know, skin tight silk breeches and frock coats and cravats and, yeah. and everything about them was completely alien to the Chinese way of life then. Mm. Their, their fashion, their language. They, in Chinese culture, uh, red haired, um, you know, red hair indicates that they're demons. In, yeah. in Chinese theatre, the, the, the devil always has red hair mm -hmm. and so to have red-haired blue-eyed mm -hmm. british ambassadors yes, it is. so um i learned so much um and apart from that it was the most wonderful trip you know the the food the architecture the temples the landscape china is mm -hmm. such a beautiful mm -hmm beautiful mm. um country and of course most of the most beautiful plants in the world come from china mm. so roses peonies mm. chrysanthemums jasmine um th these are all chinese flowers and it was called the flowery kingdom and mm. um i i of course am a very keen gardener <laughs> so um yeah I, um, <laughs> it, it appears <laughs> i mean <laughs> I mean, um, a plant lover will have a great time reading uh, this book. But I kept wondering, uh, uh, David traveling to China, I kept wondering whether the story of the old man Hong, was it a true story or it's one of the local myths that you pick up and then weave into the, the, the novel? So the fairy tale of the Blue Rose, um, which is, you know, gave me my title uh, for my book. Um, it's a story of impossible love set in a, a kind of medieval China. China. And when I first read it, I thought it was a Chinese fairy tale. And I was mm. so excited because um, I wanted to use a Chinese fairy tale uh, as a, a form of intertextuality, you know, within, mm. within my narrative. Um, but, you know, I'm a fairy tale scholar as well as an author, and I investigated the history of, of mm. the fairy tale. And I found that the, that the version that I, I knew had been written by um, a British man, um, <laughs> you know, in, in around 1911, and that he had, he had travelled to China um, and Japan and, uh, as, a, um, as a journalist. As a young mm. man and when he came back he wrote this story the blue rose now the idea of the blue rose is ancient it, it appears mm. in many many cultures because it's impossible there are mm. many many different colored roses but they don't contain blue. the gene for the color blue and so there are no blue roses it's a it's a long-held symbol of um, yearning for the impossible um, so he was certainly not the first person to write this fairy tale, and it is possible he heard a story like it when he was in China and wrote it when he got back. I, I've been unable to ascertain the truth of that. 
Mm. But by that time, I'd imagined my it, it, the scene where David is told the blue rose fairy tale and it was so vivid in my imagination and it worked so well in my narrative <laughs> that um, I drew upon it um, and invented the the actual merchant um, is actually based on a on a, a, a true merchant person. and for his personal story he was um, he came from a poor family he fell in love with the daughter of a rich man mm. he worked all of his life to make um, his fortune so he could marry the love of his life. But then mm. he left her because he was in, engaged upon expanding his fortune mm. and she died um, tragically. And then he lost his entire fortune in a fire. That's all true. That actually mm. happened. It's, it's, um, in, the, it's uh, in the historical record. Um, and mm. so I drew upon... Um, the true life of a true merchant in um, Canton at the time. Mm. But um, the scene where he tells the story of the Blue Rose to David is, of course, entirely imaginary. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's truly a captivating story. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so um, one last uh, question. I mean, um, uh, you have written books on... on, on um, Uh, historical fiction fairy tales of Europeans and uh, Chinese origins. Uh, have you had a chance to to look into, I mean, Aboriginals, uh, Australian uh, communities, and see whether uh, they have uh, their own fairy tales? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm I'm completely fascinated by the by the myths and fairy tales of all cultures. Mm -hmm. And particularly, I'm interested in the um, eerie echoes um, between fairy tales and myths across cultures. Mm -hmm. um, I I love um, the uh, the myths of the Australian Aboriginal, um, and you know their sacred um, cycles of stories are enormously mm -hmm. powerful and filled with mm -hmm. um, meaning. Um, and I am always eager to listen to Indigenous storytellers, um, and I do so when, whenever I, I get the chance. Um, I, I love this idea in Australia that we have of song lines, mm -hmm. which, are, which you know, cross the whole vast landscape of Australia and are connected, you know, uh, in, uh, Indigenous people of different Um, language groups um, and, and different countries mm -hmm. are connected by these shared stories and mm. these stories act as memory palaces and mm. as, um, you know, uh, lines of law and lines of um, meaning. Um, I just find it so, so um, fascinating and I think there's so much wisdom contained in these stories but you know what I find really interesting as well is how many parallels there are to other mythic cycles and mm. so for example in Australia we have a very common myth called the story of the seven sisters mm. which is um, an explanation for the Pleiades a, a cluster of seven stars in the mm. night sky And this is one of the most common um, Indigenous myths in Australia. Um, you see it again and again, and it's, it's captured in ancient art and dance and theatre and storytelling. But, of course, the story of the Seven Sisters appears all over the world. Yeah. And um, we, you know, the name of the star cluster, the uh, Pleiades, actually comes from ancient Greek myth. And in Japan... It's called the Suzuki, and mm. but um, you can actually only see six stars with the naked eye, and so it's only if it, um, uh, cultures that were able to invent telescopes that know that there are seven stars in the cluster. So that's why the, you know Suzuki has only six stars in the mm. car's logo because you can only see six stars with the human eye, but in Australia. They know that it's seven stars. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. I mean, I yeah. mean, uh, this 
local wisdom, fairy tales, it's somehow they represent what I believe is 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 a magical uh, and and perennial connection between I, us all. I mean, I absolutely agree with you. That's that, that's why I'm so drawn to them because it's um you know the human stories that explain or not explain but um help us in our search to understand this mysterious and magical universe that that Mm -hmm. we live in and the the, these connections the fact that all human cultures Mm -hmm. tell stories not all human cultures invented the wheel because they didn't Mm. need it but all human cultures have created stories stories that well, we need them. <laughs> and we, 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 I think we need them more right now at this present moment with mm. what's happened in, I mean, in the U.S., uh, what's currently happening in France uh, with the topic of your book, but now the, the country yeah. itself. Now, do you think fairy tales, this magical connection we have, will somehow play an important role in save our futures? You know, I absolutely do. Um, And, you know, we know from history that whenever a culture, whenever a country is invaded and overcome and colonized, um, the first thing that the invaders do is set out to destroy that country's culture. They destroy its art and they destroy its stories. And so preserving the stories of our ancestors is an act of defiance and rebellion Mm -hmm. and resistance. And we must, all of us, every single living human, we must fight to keep alive the stories of our ancestors, to learn from them wisdom, and then to make sure we pass that wisdom on to our children as well. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. That's uh, truly inspiring and truly refreshing. Now, uh, hi everyone. That's uh, Kate Forsyth. Uh, thank you, Kate, for being with us. We have reached uh, the end of uh, the sessions, so I truly appreciate uh, you have agreed to join us in the conversation, Kate. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. I've loved chatting to you. The, uh, the feeling is mutual, Kate. So, <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, bye. Uh, Kembali uh, 2020 was made possible with the support of the Yayasan Mudraswari Saraswati, patron programs and their donors. The patron program was created to seek assistance for the survival of both festival and the foundation. By making a valuable contribution to the Yayasan patron program, you will be directly involved in delivering both festival in due time. Follow Ubud Writers Festival on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, or visit ubudwriterfestival.com for more information. Thank you, everyone. That's uh, conclude our session.